first students that started talking to me when I first got this position. So I was emailing her when I was still in Denmark. I think we actually met at a Starbucks in San Jose the day that I was signing my starting job paperwork. Um, and when we were talking, one of the things that came up is that she was really interested in tagging. She wanted to tag whales. Um, and at that point, I was finishing a postdoc, or still, I guess, kind of analyzing the data. Um, and we had a new tag that was supposed to measure heart rate in uh, whales at some point. It has now, four years later. Um, but at this point, we were going to try it out on bottlenose dolphins, and this was going to be potentially Heather's thesis project. So she actually came out with me to Sarasota, um, where we caught dolphins and we put a heart rate tag on them. But for some reason, we were not getting any good data. The tags fell off. It was noisy. And we just realized the tag wasn't quite ready. So then we moved on to, OK, well, what is something else that we can do? So we at least figured this out you know, before she officially started that the tag wasn't going to be working. Um, and she had done some work with whale sharks. And so we're like, well, there's the word whale in it. This might <laughs> <laughs> know nothing about sharks. Um, but they made some noise when she had been down there before, and that had never been documented. And so we talked with Allison, and it seemed like this might be a, a potential way to kind of figure out where these animals were. So Heather went out and tracked down some acoustic recorders and organized a field project, a research team, um, which was impressive for someone in their first year of their master's, went down to Mexico, deployed all these loggers, worked really hard, and then came <laughs> back and listened to the data, and unfortunately there was no whale sounds. So at this point we've gone through two project ideas, but at least only one year into the master's project. And I like to say this is kind of how science works. Unfortunately, when you're in a master's program, it's uh, a little more frustrating when you're trying to get out quickly. But we decided let's do something a little bit safer and closer to home. And as, uh, I guess, right after you graduated, you worked for Sora. Uh, and so she was good friends with Gina. They had, um, the Sea Otter Savvy was doing observations. And so she kind of went back to her roots. So these are pictures from her when she was working with Sea Otter Sa or, uh, Sora years ago. And then for the next two years, she continued to spend a lot of time looking at otters and worked so hard, she <laughs> hardly even stopped to eat. <laughs> <laughs> Despite all the hours spent observing otters, she also managed to help out on a lot of other projects. She was a key member um, helping out with Rizzo dolphin work out of the bay. She helped out with wiener wane of elephant seals and tag reef sites um, and on Nuevo. She even made the sacrifice to go down to Costa Rica and work with leather, <laughs> leather guy turtles. Um, but when it got to be too much, she knew how to relax. Um, <laughs> As I started to look at how she relaxed, because apparently my grad students go out and have fun all the time. <laughs> uh, there was a comment of wine, it seemed to be pretty common. Uh, <laughs> medicine was needed. Uh, and somehow, with all of this, she still managed to figure out what most graduate students can't figure out, and that was apparently how to you know, make some cash um, from grad school. But kind of in wrapping it up, it's been actually really fun to have Heather in the lab uh, and watch her transitions. She spent a lot of time in the field. She cleans up nicely. She's had some <laughs> milestones uh, in her graduate career, so that's her bachelorette party. You can see the SEAL people actually can look normal. <laughs> um, all the way, she managed to even fit in a marriage in the uh, master's degree program. Um, and then she's had quite a few successes. So she was awarded the San Jose State Alumni Dean's Award. Um, she's also been awarded Myers Oceanographic Trust, and there's probably others, but I was trying to check her website and couldn't find them all. Um, and then with that, I leave it to Heather to tell you about all the cool, cool work she's been doing the last few years. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let her take over. If you guys don't want me to take bad pictures, don't post them on Facebook. <laughs> some of those pictures in a really long time. That was great. <laughs> yeah, so thank you, Gita. And um, thank you all for being here today, especially on a Friday afternoon. I know that sometimes Friday afternoons can be rough, especially with traffic. I heard that it was kind of bad today with Memorial Day weekend. But looking out, I'm seeing people from all different phases of my life. And it means a lot to see you guys here. So 
thank you for being here. I am so very excited to finally be able to share with you guys my thesis, The Energetic Cost of Human Disturbance on the Southern Sea Otter. And so I'm gonna jump right into the issue. People are getting too close. And for many, it's difficult for them to recognize certain actions as being disturbance to wildlife, but in reality, it is a growing concern in discussion of human-wildlife conflict. And these images that you're seeing are just a few, but they all are depicting people getting extremely close to wildlife. And with disturbance, there is a potential for increased avoidance behavior, increased stress levels, reduced foraging, habituation, change in habitat use, and potential injury to the animal in, or even the human. And since researching this issue, I do feel that it can be broken down into three main factors of why it's becoming a concern for California. And the first is economics. California has been and still is experiencing an economic boom. And with that comes an increase in population, an increase in tourism, and ultimately an increase in traffic. And so when you couple that with limited coastline, it gets really, really crowded. <laughs> the second is the birth of social media and smartphones. And so I was looking back and I didn't even remember that smart, the iPhone, the first one, came out in 2007. That was only 12 years ago. And so we are changing how we use, create, and view media. And so the clip that you are watching is a recent advertisement from Apple to promote the iPhone's camera quality. And it is a very sexy video. It looks really, really cool. But what most people overlook is that all of those behaviors that you are watching are fight or flight. Some of them are quite aggressive. I do not recommend using your um, smartphone to take photos of a rattlesnake that close. That's a bad idea. <laughs> but regardless whether an iPhone actually took those photos or they most likely had professional help, they are advertising that you should use your device in that way, that it's your adventure camera. And so we are seeing this in Central California tourism. So more tourists are using their smartphones for wildlife photography, and then they post those for others to see. And that creates a desire for people to do the same. But ultimately, these devices are not designed for wildlife photography. They are designed for selfies. And unfortunately, trying to selfie with a wild animal means you get too close. And so the third fact is that wildlife exist in the areas in which we like to recreate. And we like to have meaningful moments with them. And this resulting disturbance can have physiological as well as be potentially behavioral consequences, which can have a cost. And so that is what I'm going to be focusing on with you all today. And so as seen by those previ previous photos, this is not just a sea otter issue, but I am gonna argue that sea otters are an ideal study species for disturbance. And it really stems from their behavior as well as their physiology. So first, they are already experiencing high levels of disturbance from tourism. And this is really fueled by public love. So sea otters are charismatic, um, public and media labels them as cute and cuddly, and so there's a target on them the minute that people arrive. But with these close encounters, sea otters are a species that generally tend to exhibit visible behavior changes. So for example, this kayak getting close has those sea otters avoiding them by diving under the water. We can record those activities and then couple them with previously recorded metabolic rates to quantify an energetic cost. The second reason why they are a model species is that there is a concern for their energetic balance. Sea otters have the highest mass-specific metabolic rate of any marine mammal, and this is because they do not store fat as blubber as many other marine mammal species. And that's mainly due to the fact that they are recent additions to the marine environment. They have not had that same length of timeline as cetaceans and pinnipeds. Rather, sea otters rely on their dense fur and their high metabolic rate to maintain their inter internal body temperature. And so their fur is the densest of any marine mammal, up to 165,000 hairs per square centimeter. And it actually has barbs on them that you can see that those connect and they're able to blow warm air into their fur and that warm air keeps the cold water at bay, making sure it doesn't touch their skin. The infrared video that you're watching is a great visual to demonstrate that sea otters run hot, close to 100 degrees Fahrenheit, and are constantly losing heat to that 45 to 60 degree water. So the main takeaway I want you guys to have from this is that otters are constantly burning through energy and it's extremely expensive. So if you're considering the fact that just merely maintaining one's own self is extremely expensive, <laughs> imagine the increased cost for a reproductive female. So lactation is the most energetically demanding period of a female mammal's life. And for sea otters, 
their energetic demands nearly doubled during lactation and pup care. And so in this figure, you can see that the daily metabolic demands are on the y-axis across time and days, and you can see in the dark gray how that increases for a female just maintaining herself, and then in black is the female having to also increase metabolic demands for her pup. And so recent research has shown that this demand has females living at their energetic limits. And so end lactation syndrome is the massive depletion of energy reserves post weaning. And it's the emaciation that can lead to death. And ELS was the major cause of death in 57% of females from this study. And so you can see that that percent of uh, sea otters on the y-axis, reproductive stage five, the red is emaciated. So you can see that about 90% of females were starving. So balancing their energetic budget is critical and it's a huge concern for sea otters. So if that's the case, how are they even surviving? <laughs> how are they balancing their energetic budget? And the truth is there are a few things that you can do. You can increase your intake, you can eat a lot, right? You can decrease your output, you can rest a lot, and you can maintain your insulation, right? By grooming, you're being able to maintain that air bubble. You wanna make sure you have that warm air against your skin. So if I break these down into looking at what's happening as a budget in their day, you can see that resting and feeding huge portions of their day. If you are feeding 35, 34% of your day, that is a lot of food. Um, so sea otters actually consume an amount of food equivalent to approximately a quarter of their body mass every day. <laughs> That's a lot. So this consumption, in turn, that voracious appetite, basically puts pressure on the surrounding nearshore community. And that pressure has ecological implications. Sea otters are considered a keystone species, which essentially means they're an organism that has a large-scale effect that's disproportionate to their abundance. And that term stems from architecture. The keystone, or that center stone, puts pressure down on the supporting stones, and it creates an arch. So when the keystone is removed, the remaining stones fall. And that's an analogy that the ecological community is altered. Um, interactions may disappear, they may change, and for Central California, there are two examples that include sea otters. Um, the first is with kelp forests. The second is with eelgrass communities. So I do want to note that this is a, these are simplified interactions for visual purposes. So for California kelp forests, there may be more than one keystone species, potentially keystone mesopredators. But regardless, the impact of sea otters is still important. And so with the presence of sea otters, urchins populations grow, uh, urchin populations are regulated, allowing kelp to grow, as are the crabs in eelgrass communities. And so you can see in these photos, these are two healthy communities. But with sea otters removed, the trophic cascades change. You can see that biomass change. And so in kelp forests, the urchin populations increase, and they limit the growth, which can result in urchin barrens, which you can see in that photo. While similarly for eelgrass communities, the increased crab population consumes the sea slugs, which releases algae from pressure and then can smother the eelgrass, and it restricts their growth. And you can see what that would look like in that photo. And ultimately, these ecological communities in certain areas along the Pacific coast have been experiencing altered systems for quite a while. Because sea otters were hunted for that dense fur that we talked about. Their prized fur was um, hunted during the fur trade of the 18th and 19th centuries, and this consequently altered nearshore communities. And by 1911, there were only remnant colonies of sea otters where historic range should have been. So currently, the California, or what we're calling the Southern Sea Otters range, is between north of Santa Cruz and a little south of Point Conception. And this recovery is due to the protection and the management of the species. The Southern Sea Otter was listed as threatened under the Dangerous Species Act, and it was due to the fact that they have a reduced range, reduced population, and vulnerability to oil spills from coastal tanker traffic. And as a consequence of this threatened status, sea otters were then also recognized as depleted under the Marine Mammal Protection Act. And the Marine Mammal Protection Act protects all marine mammals in US waters. And then in 1994, it was amended to include protection against harassment, which is broken down into two different categories. And the first is level A harassment. And that is the, defined as any act of pursuit, torment, in which that there can be potential to injure a marine mammal. And this is just two examples of what that would mean. The second is level B harassment. And that is the potential to disturb or actually causing disruption of behavioral patterns. And that can include 
migration, breeding, nursing, feeding, sheltering, um, all those different behaviors. And so it's not necessarily a direct injury. However, impacts to those behaviors could have long-term changes that may negatively impact populations. And so from the Marine Mammal Protection Act, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, gives recommended viewing guidelines. And these are posted online. An underlying issue, though, is that although marine mammals are protected from harassment, and these viewing guidelines are listed, um, they vary by region, by state, by species. And ultimately, species, as well as populations within the same species, may not be reacting the same way, and not to mention that enforcing these guidelines is extremely challenging. And so for sea otters, they actually are lumped in with seals and sea lions, and that's to remain 50 yards away. And yet it's not necessarily known if that's an appropriate distance, that's just an overall distance. And so there really is a need to begin to look at different species and populations to better investigate what are the best recommended distances. So it's not only adhering to the definitions that are listed under their protection, but also being realistic measurement for viewers. Which brings me to the project's objecti objectives. That was to determine the frequency and degree of disturbance. So I really wanted to know how does sea otter response differ between locations and distance stimuli? So as you get closer and closer to an otter, what's going to happen? How does that change? The second was to determine factors that influence sea otter response. So I wanted to know how does pup presence, kelp canopy, time of day, and um, group size, how does that impact their response during the disturbance? as well as what is the energetic cost? So what is the average daily cost for a sea otter given specific disturbance scenarios? How close that kayak or kayak or what type of boat? Um, wanted to explore all the different scenarios. So for this project, there were three main locations. We had Moss Landing, Monterey, and Morro Bay. And these represented a variety of habitats. We had estuary, harbor, and open bay. And there are three sites listed at each location where sea otters had high, where sea otter groups and high levels of tourism overlap. And at each site, scans were conducted um, by volunteers, students, interns of the Sea Otter Savvy Program. And it's a citizen science outreach program that's focused on investigating sea otter disturbance. And I collaborate, collaborated with Sea Otter Savvy for my thesis. And so Sea Otter Savvy began collecting data back in 2015, and scans were done through all seasons and throughout the week for thorough coverage. And as of last September, the effort resulted in 652 scan sessions, over 1,300 observation hours, and over 72,000 instantaneous sea otter activity states. So all of those volunteers that are here, you should be so proud. We could not have done this without you. It's an amazing data set to work with. Um, and so each session of these is two hours long. And so every scan that's conducted happens within 15 minute intervals. So every 15 minutes, imagine there's a snapshot of what's happening of those otters and everything that's occurring in those moments. So you are gonna record behavior, the stimuli, the distance between the stimuli and the otter using range finders, kelp canopy, pup presence, um, all the different factors that may be influencing sea otter behavior. And below on the left is just a couple examples of stimuli. Um, and that they are also then classified for the model. So for example, kayaks and paddle boards are considered small craft. And then on the right, you can see that we have listed a couple of behaviors, there are many, many more, but that those are also categorized into one of the two different activity states, inactive or active. And that was important for the model that I used for analysis. So I used um, a newly developed hidden Markov model designed in MATLAB and fit to that instantaneous scan data um, to predict sea otter activity. And so hidden Markov models are an extremely powerful predictive technique and are used to model stochastic systems, basically systems that have randomly changing outcomes. And because of this, hidden Markov models have become extremely popular through biology, chemistry, and economics. And it's especially helpful when considering behavior because for an otter, at any given moment in time, there is an element of random choice of what and where it can go next. And those obviously can be influenced by external factors of what it's thinking about. I wanna go see Joe, I'm hungry, that kayak's in my way. We need to account for all of those. So hidden Markov models are considered a dynamic model, meaning that it depends on an element of time and it allows um, those variables to interact over time. 
essentially allowing us to include a variety of external factors that may be influencing behavior as a process. And so and that's important because behavior is complex. It's fluid. It's not static. Okay? So what you do in one moment in time is going to impact what you potentially do in the next moment in time. So for example, the kayak ends up being in your way or you really wanted to go rest with your buddies. And that can happen in different sequential points in time. So therefore, sea otter activity can transition from one state to another, which allows us to use transition probabilities. So for example, the matrix that you're seeing is showing that if an otter is, an active, is active in the previous time step, there are probabilities associated to whether it's going to remain active in the next time step. There's also probabilities that are if it's first active and then it becomes inactive. And then if it's first active, what if it becomes active? So each one of those represent probabilities for each of one state going to the next one. So returning to the hidden aspect of the title, <laughs> it is a hidden Markov model. This type of model is used when not all of the variables are observable. So what I mean is that we can observe and measure certain variables, but such as activity state, the distance between the otter and the stimulus, what type of stimulus, but ultimately our variable of interest is the true response to disturbance. And that I cannot observe. Um, and therefore that is the hidden variable of our model. And we tried, uh, it, so if, even if I did try to include the true response to disturbance in this model, there would ultimately be human bias. So at no point was data collected and a disturbance labeled in data collection. And so really all we were focusing on are the observable variables, distance, potential stimuli, et cetera. And the mo model then probabilistically infers the true response of sea otter activity due to that particular disturbance. So there are a lot of different variables, and to incorporate all of these, there were also a lot of different series of equations. However, I've simplified them into separate components so that way we can walk through each one. So don't freak out, that's not a scary, that's not the scariest of them. <laughs> I'm showing you the easy ones. <laughs> so I'm interested in the probability of a sea otter being active. That is a probabilistic function of the behavior in the previous time step, okay? The external fixed effects, what changes your behavior, potential disturbance stimuli, as well as the stochastic variation. So now I'm gonna walk through each one of these so everyone's on the same page. So for behavior in the previous time step, there's really only two options, right? We have active or inactive. And so that's how you can start. And then next, there's really only two other options you can go to from either one of those initial states. But let's assume that a behavior is going to not change if everything's held constant, okay? Nothing else is changing. Then that behavior will continue until a kayak appears, just falls from the sky 10 meters away. <laughs> and then the resulting possible outcomes are still, if you are active first, okay? There's a probability that you will remain active despite that kayak being there. There's also that if you are active, perhaps you freeze. You stop moving with that kayak being near you. There's the probability if you're sleeping in an inactive state that the kayak being close to you, you have no idea it's there, so you remain inactive and resting. Or you, like that sea otter getting poked, wake up, startle, and you become active. So these, again, are just all the different uh, visual representation of the transition probabilities that we talked about in that matrix. So the model, when thinking about behavior, also had to contain a centralizing tendency function. And so if we're thinking about the percent of activity on the Y, and there's high, which is 100% active and low, 100% inactive. Um, if an otter's activity state increases due to a stimulus being present, it can remain at full activity for only so long. And that's just logic. It cannot remain active forever, nor can it remain resting forever. It would die. So <laughs> it would not survive. Um, and so the function allows mean activity level to basically pull, be pulled back to that overall average value, whether they are higher or lower than that average, which can occur either because of that stochastic variation in activity or because of the effects of disturbance in previous time steps. So the next component was the external fixed effects. And these are just all the different things that could influence sea otter behavior. So Basically, what's impacting how they respond to a disturbance? Are they going to be more sensitive or maybe less responsive? And it's how we are. Basically, what surrounds you affects how you feel. Are you hot? Are you hungry? 
Do you not like the person sitting next to you? That all can ultimately affect what you do next. And for sea otters, I included time of day, kelp canopy, pup presence, and group size as those covariate values. And so next, we also have to include the potential disturbance in the current as well as the previous time steps. And I'm calling those the perturbation variables. And so we have to understand, we have to know what type of stimulus it is. Is it small craft, large craft, et cetera? We need to know how many of them are there. And mo like almost most importantly, we have to know how far away it is from that otter, that stimulus distance. And all of those need to be incorporated to really determine that impact. So lastly, the model includes stochastic variation, which is the unexplained residual error, and that's basically the differences seen in the data. So for example, if I play the same set of conditions over and over again, this sea otter, Bob, is in Groundhog Day. And so how he's gonna react could be different, even though everything is held constant. So given the same set of conditions, what Bob's gonna do, oh, he's alert first, but he's in Groundhog Day, he dives next. So essentially, it's the, the, sto the stochasticity needs to be included to account for that type of variation. We need to include the things that happen even though we don't necessarily know why. And so now I'm gonna set up how we used all of those variables to interpret our results. So one of the first things we were interested in was the effect of distance and location. And so to do that, I used the potential for disturbance, which is a unitless index, and it was derived to better compare potential for disturbance across distances at the different locations. And so when plotting this as a function of distance, um, this is the main thing I just want you guys to remember for now, is that zero is minimum. There is nothing there. But one, it can only go to one. That is the maximum. And that basically means no more, that's the full potential you could have. That kayak smacked into that sea otter. Um, <laughs> so we will come back to this during the results, but hold on to that. The next, if we, were if we are interested in the effect of external factors, I use the relative disturbance effect. So it is merely the difference between the probability or the likelihood of activity with a stimulus from without. So basically, it's run, the model's run with both of those scenarios, with a disturbance and without, and subtracted to get the potential increase of that mean expected activity due to a disturbance, so that way we can compare. But to do comparisons, we do have to standardize some values. And so what we're seeing here is that this standard covariate values are just to represent what, an, what would be average for a sea otter. So the group size is 10. There's 10 otters in the group. Pup ratio is 50%. That would mean you have five pups. Kelp canopy is 50%. Five of them are in kelp. Time of day, morning. Initial activity is 50% because we have to choose something, and sea otters are fidgety. So that seems like the best choice. <laughs> um, standard stimulus. Small craft, that ended up being the most of what we see, and that represents kayaks, paddle boards, and we chose 10 meters to make sure that it was close enough to that we were gonna be seeing a response, and standard location was Monterey. So now, if we want to compare these, we had to have the comparison values as well. So group size, we wanted to compare one versus 20. For pup ratio, zero, so no pups versus all the pups, 100%. Kelp canopy, zero versus 100%. Time of day is just broken down into morning, midday, and afternoon. So for example, if we are going to look at group size, right, the comparison value is one through 20. However, all of those other covariate values are gonna be held at that standard that we previously determined, okay? So again, as another example, I go to pup ratio. You can see that pup ratio is now gonna be between zero and 100%, but all of the other ones, so group size went back to 10 because that was our standard. So essentially, you're only changing one variable at a time while holding all else constant. So then lastly, we wanted to look at energetic cost, and to do that, I had to have a conversion. So the cost, I estimated the energetic cost for disturbance by calculating the metabolic expenditures associated with the increased time spent in that behavior due to a typical, what we're calling the typical disturbance scenario, relative to behavior when there is no disturbance. So essentially, that's just the field metabolic rate with disturbance minus the field metabolic rate without just no disturbance, okay? So I did this for both an average male and an average independent female using previously recorded metabolic rates. And so both of those inactive states um, are represented by resting metabolic rates. And for males, I use the swimming metabolic rate to represent the active state as it was the most common avoidance behavior. 
And for females, I use the published average active metabolic rate as it represents the active state. All metabolic uh, values were then rescaled to correspond to that 15 minute time step interval of the instantaneous scan data. But again, we needed to set standard values, so what are we considering a standard disturbance scenario? And that's group size 10, pup ratio 50%, kelp canopy 50%, stimulus small craft, again, that was the majority of what we would be seeing. Stimulus, uh, disturbance frequency six, that's the average. Stimulus distance 20 meters, um, location Monterey. So now we've gotten to our results, the meat. So returning to the first objective of determining the effect of disturbance um, and location, I began with my sea otter bullseye. And I do this because I feel that it helps introduce the concept that I will be discussing in the following figure. So the objective was to investigate how distance and location influence sea otter of uh, the impact of disturbance. So ideally, I want to explore distance thresholds based off of scan data for each of those locations. So as the stimulus is getting, uh, this for example is a kayak, getting closer and closer to that sea otter, I'm interested what is the expected potential for disturbance given different distances and different locations. So this figure is showing the potential for disturbance. Remember that's the unitless index from zero, which is the minimum, one is the maximum on the y-axis and distance from a stimulus on the uh, x-axis. So essentially as a stimulus is approaching an otter, the potential for disturbance increases exponentially. And so we are seeing in black the average potential for disturbance across locations. But I can break these down. So we have Moss Landing, Monterey, and Morro Bay. One of them is not like the others. So we can see that Morro Bay is not necessarily exhibiting the same potential for disturbance. Something's happening there. So if I'm looking at 0.1 potential for disturbance, or 10% of the maximum potential for disturbance, on the average, that's at 49 meters, okay? But if I'm looking at that same potential for disturbance at Morro Bay, that's 24 meters. So that means that I can be closer to sea otters in Morro Bay, but still have the same potential for disturbance. So, but what's interesting is that if I now want to consider Monterey, if I'm considering 24 meters, okay, that same distance from Morro, at Morro Bay to Monterey, the same 24 meter distance causes greater than 30% potential for disturbance in Monterey. So you can, see, you can clearly see for this that not all locations are exhibiting the same potential for disturbance um, given the same distances. And so we are gonna discuss this a little bit further towards the end, so just hold on to this. But one of the things I really wanna note for the advantage of why we are using the potential for disturbance for these comparisons is that it's a context independent comparison. Um, so it's measuring the relative potential for disturbance irrespective of those covariate values, pup presence, all of that type of stimulus, okay? And we felt that this would be a useful tool for management agencies to explore disturbance thresholds. And I'm not making any suggestions um, as to what those thresholds should be. Rather, I'm showing how this can be used as a tool to discuss appropriate viewing distances and potential thresholds based off of the behavioral state data. So our second objective was to determine the external factors that were influencing sea otter behavior and response. And so we're first gonna start with just looking at the mean expected activity levels, which is basically the likelihood of being active. So now remember to do any of those comparisons, we do have to do our standard values. So I put them up there to remind ourselves that if we're looking at group size, the comparison is one versus 20, while all those others are held constant at that previously decided standard, okay? So we are now seeing the mean expected activity level, probability or likelihood of, um, probability or likelihood of activity on the y-axis, and we are seeing the comparing group sizes, one versus 20 on the x-axis. And so we can see that the mean expected activity level for a group of one versus 20 is significantly, oh, sorry, this is to remind you, there's no disturbance here. <laughs> no disturbance, remember that. <laughs> there are statistic, they are statistic, statistically significant. Um, so you, this basically means that um, a larger group, you are more likely to be less active. And that makes sense. Sea otters tend to rest in groups. That's generally what we see. So this supports that. So now that we're oriented, let's look at all four of those external factors. So now that we're looking at all four, 
we can see that um, only group size and kelp canopy are exhibiting a significant difference. Um, pup ratio and time of day do not show a significant difference. Um, there's slight trends you can see in time of day. Afternoon is a little bit higher in the mean. Um, otters do tend to like to go forage in the afternoon. Perhaps that's potentially why you would have that increase there. But looking back at kelp canopy, the presence of 100% kelp coverage indicates a significantly lower mean expected activity level. So that's the 100% is at 0 0.08, so it's 8% likely to be active, versus the other, which is at 32% likely to be active. So by looking at mean expected activity level um, without disturbance, we are able to get a better idea of when sea otters may be more vulnerable to a disturbance. Essentially, it's expected that an otter with a lower mean activity level has um, more potential to increase that activity, right? So a resting otter can become active and increase that activity level. An active otter is already active. <laughs> so you're not gonna have that same degree of change. Um, so to explore the increase of expected activity of disturbance, we are now gonna look back at that R, rel the relative disturbance effect, the RDE. So now we are looking at relative disturbance of effect and the 95% credible intervals on the y-axis and compare it to the factor on the x-axis. Again, we're just gonna start with group size. Um, and you can see, again, those are our standardized values. We've added in standard stimulus, so now we're gonna have a disturbance. It's a kayak at 10 meters. So to remind you what RDE is, since it was a couple slides ago, all it is is that it is the mean expected activity level, what we just talked about, run with and without a disturbance, and it's the difference between them, okay? So this kind of shows you that you have, with no disturbance in green, you have disturbance in orange, and it's the difference. We're looking to that increase or that difference. Um, and so if we are looking at RDE, we see that for group size, there's no statistical significant difference, okay? So between one otter and 20 otters. What that means is that regardless if you have one otter or 20 otters um, with a kayak that ends up being 10 meters away, both group scenarios respond with similar increases in their mean expected activity level. So now that we've oriented it to one, we are now looking at all four of those external factors. And across the board, there's no significant differences, okay? So each of the covariates show that with a disturbance of that kayak at 10 meters, all of the comparisons are likely to increase similarly. So we do learn that a disturbance activity is likely to, um, what we do learn is that with disturbance activity is likely to increase, but with expected activity is not necessarily different between those comparisons, okay? Which was surprising at first. We expected to, prob we expected to see some difference. Um, but we realized that what we're actually more interested in is the initial state of that otter and the amount, not necessarily the amount of that disturbance effect. As I just said, a sea otter that's resting, if we're only talking about two different activity states, active and inactive, if you are inactive, you can become active, right? If you're already active, <laughs> we're more concerned with the resting otter increasing energy loss, right? So although RDE did surprise us and still show a response to disturbance, we realized that the likelihood of activity without disturbance was more telling and that this project, um, for this project when looking at external variables such as kelp um, and group size. So now let's consider the final objective, determining energetic cost. And so we first need to begin with activity. So the probability of uh, being active is on the y-axis, and the time of day from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. is on the x-axis. And our specific parameters fed into the model are again listed as a reminder. So we're in Monterey, one sea otter, 50% pups, 50% kelp. However, when I add in one, a small craft six times a day, okay, that's the average disturbance frequency at 20 meters, we can see that the probability of a sea otter being active under those conditions spikes. So now, to find the cost of that increased activity, we need to take the difference between those and convert into the activity into kilojoules using the previously recorded metabolic rates. And then magically, it just does it for me. But <laughs> so remember that to quantify the energetic cost, the previously recorded metabolic rates were coupled with the active and inactive behaviors, okay? So for this one example, I am just showing you the average male, and those metabolic rates are posted there. So at any one point along that blue line, that's just the cost at that one moment in time. That's just the cost at 12 o'clock noon. 
but I want to know what the cost is for the day. And so that's everything underneath that blue line. And so for this particular disturbance scenario, it's 212 kilojoules for that average male. And the truth is I can run these simulations for different disturbance scenarios, and we can create a cost table, basically a way to see energetic cost across multiple scenarios, like this. And so these are just a few pulled out from Monterey, but it represents the average energetic cost given the simulation of one small craft, okay, we run with a thousand iterations to account for that stochastic variation given each specific disturbance scenario. So blue is representing the average male, green is representing that independent female, and the mean daily disturbance cost in 95% credible intervals can range by stimuli distance. So here I'm just showing you an example. I'm showing 10 and 50, but it can range from 10 all the way, whatever I want it to be, but I'm just showing you 10 and 50. It also can show corresponding to the given number of disturbances per day. Was there two kayaks or was there 12 kayaks or increasing throughout? And so with this, I can provide baseline values given a multitude of scenarios. And I can do this for other locations as well, not just Monterey. But to help visualize these trends, I pulled from the energetic cost table to look at how daily energetic cost compared across locations, okay? So the average disturbance frequency is maintaining at six, of, and we're sticking with small craft. But the daily energetic cost for an average male, is what we're looking at right now, is on the Y axis, and um, then the locations are separated on the x-axis, and then you can see the differing um, distances in different colors. So blue is 15 meters, and then that increases all the way up to yellow, which is 50 meters. So again, Morro Bay, not like the others. <laughs> so otters in Morro Bay are not losing the same amount of energy to disturbance, okay? So, and I wanna remind everyone, this is important, that since we were focused on energetic cost um, due to increase in activity levels, um, the behavior alert was listed as inactive. And that's not to say that there aren't costs associated with being alert. You can have increased heart rate, there can be more stress levels, but for this particular project, it was not included as actually being a physical activity. So that might be an interesting focus for Morro Bay, is that potentially those otters are aware of disturbance and are alert, however, they are still being marked as inactive. Um, and so they might be also resisting to becoming active. And that's another question that we'll be talking about in the um, discussion section. However, overall, you can see that the closer you are to a sea otter, right? So the closer that stimulus is, the more energy is used, okay? So that blue, that's showing you the closer you are, a lot more energy used. So when I plot the independent um, female values, though they are slightly lower cost due to the mass, you can see similar trends. They are still showing that the closer you are, the increase in energetic cost. So discussing cost in kilojoules, it's really hard to relate to. So I wanted to explore what this meant as prey needed to make up that cost. So to explore what this means in terms of prey, I used Oftedal's nutritional report for sea otters to estimate the number of prey needed to make up the disturbance cost for three different species. I pulled out Dungeness crab, Pacific little neck clam, and Monterey tegula, which is a type of a snail. And that you can see the independent female, and then you also can see male in bold, and I'm um, using the male values for visual representation. And you can really see that depending on which prey, otter, uh, which prey an otter is eating, could really make a difference as to the nutritional value, as well as potential foraging effort. And so I wanna hold that thought though. Let's pretend that it's not the average day in Monterey. Let's pretend it's a beautiful, sunny Memorial Day weekend, okay? So if I just doubled frequency, and that's even a low estimate, some of our higher um, frequencies have been up to like 25 times per day, but if I just go up to 12 times per day, um, you can see that that increases, it increases to 392 kilojoules, which basically means it's representing over half a crab all the way up to the over 36 snails for that male. But let's consider, if sea otters are eating a quarter of their mass per day, all of these different prey scenarios, and this is for male or female, that only represents 1% of their daily requirement. So it does appear that it's a small cost for one day. It also makes you realize, geez, they really do eat a lot. <laughs> <laughs> that's incredible. <laughs> Don't even want to know, that's a lot of snails. <laughs> but the truth is, this is not the full cost. This is not taking into account 
the foraging attempts, okay? So sea otters tend to be prey specialists. So depending on what they specialize on, if it's a crab specialist, it may only need one crab to make up that disturbance or a little bit more, but they are known to have lower, lower uh, foraging efficiency and it might take more dives, deeper dives. It might be more of a battle to get that crab than if you were a snail specialist. You can pick up snails pretty quickly, but then you, they're not very nutritious. You will have to pick up more. So there's trade-offs in this. So we are, not we are not including the cost of the foraging attempts in this. Um, this is also only representative of one day. So not all the days are gonna be the same. Some of them are gonna be pretty easy days, some of them are gonna be really rough days depending on what tourism is like and how sunny it is. Um, so some with more or less disturbance, the accumulation of those costs could vary as well as depending what prey limitation is like for that particular population in that area. Um, but overall, we were able to quantify energetic cost of specific disturbance scenarios and it serves as a foundation to moving forward with more disturbance-focused research. So in conclusion, analysis showed that the degree of expected activity change depends on location and stimuli distance. And our analyses clearly supported our prediction that the closer a stimulus is to a sea otter, the greater probability of a potential disturbance. And it also showed that sea otters do not respond the same way in Morro Bay. And that brought up a whole new list of questions as to why. Potential habituation. And so really, I think a closer look at Morro Bay or including new sites without similar tourism pressure, um, perhaps along different areas where you're not having that same amount of people going out, um, we can start to look at what's happening, not necessarily in hot spots, but also in areas that are not including that and getting to look at how habituation's changing um, throughout that way. So we also should include alert in future, so as a separate probability transition. So right now we were only in, focusing on inactive and active, but for Morro Bay, if sea otters are alert, they could still be responding to disturbance, but we were missing it. And so that might be something that we should include in future if we're looking for specifically habituation and disturbance. The second, for the external fixed effects, pup presence, kelp canopy, et cetera, I, it did not show significant difference when looking at the relative disturbance effect. They all shared similar increases of activity across their comparisons. But when considering mean expected activity, just the likelihood of being active without that disturbance, larger group size and more kelp canopy indicated reduced activity, which was as expected. And so really that was our concern, right? We were most concerned about sea otters resting. If they're choosing to rest, they need to. And so we, if they're gonna increase that activity, that's what we're concerned with. And lastly, I did calculate activity change and the consequent energetic cost due to disturbance given set disturbance scenarios. So again, this is not the full cost. There are latent foraging costs that are not included in this model. However, it serves as a foundation for calculating disturbance cost. It is the first model of its kind to quantify disturbance in this way and with this complexity. And so this model could in future further investigate those latent costs as well as focus specifically on reproductive females. So we report energetic costs for average male and average independent females and not for reproductive females. And that was due to the nature of our observational scans, okay? So reproductive females were not specifically identified during these scans um, and pup age was not included. So if we were to consider reproductive females in the future, we expect that their disturbance cost would be higher right, because we know that that increases during lactation and pup care for the metabolic rates. Um, and with these new questions in mind, I actually do have focal follow data that was collected um, in similar methods to acquire one minute intervals, not the 15 minute intervals, but one minute intervals. And in future, using those could enlighten how specifically reproductive females react during disturbance. And the goal would be to also include alert as a behavior for reproductive females um, because they may be resisting becoming active and that might be something that's happening in Morro Bay. There are a high proportion of reproductive females in Morro Bay and if we think about it, <laughs> we can really all relate that when um, you wake the baby, <laughs> sometimes it's a little bit harder to get that baby to go back to sleep. So it's similar to pups. When we watch female reproductive females with pups, when that pup wakes up, there is a lot of effort put back to putting that pup back to rest. So there is something that potentially would be interesting to look at if we we're able to look at more finite scale of activity in one minute intervals. But overall, the project was successful in producing a tool for exploring disturbance thresholds, 
and the energetic cost associated with given disturbance scenarios. And so with that, I have so many people to thank. It's, <laughs> it was a lot of different people that helped me through this process. Um, first of all, my advisors, Gita, Tim, Tom, thank you for all of your support and guidance through this. Sea Otter Savvy, Jenna, thank you so much for having me on the project. It has been an amazing experience. All of the volunteers, Joan, you are so stellar. <laughs> You've collected so much data. Um, and that's really who this, we would not be able to do this without the volunteers who collect this data. Um, Moss Landing Marine Labs, I have to give a special thank you to Stephanie Flora. She is the MATLAB queen. She has helped me on so many last minute moments if I really need help to understand how to write certain code. Um, and Tara for all of the support and always being like the one person that can calm you down. <laughs> Of course, my, my lab, the vertebrate lab, everyone in there is so amazing. I have made some of my best friends there. And I have to thank Jenny, Jacoby, Mason, Sharon, and Kate. All of you guys helped on this project. You spent hours out in horrible weather looking at sea otters, so thank you. And of course, my family and my friends, um, Louis and my mom, my dad, my brother, and um, all the people that have supported me through this. And of course, financial support. You can't do this without some money. But overall, it has been an amazing adventure. And I have so many great memories from all of these people who have helped shape this project and shape me through this process. And um, thank you so much. So when you were um, baselining your um, parameters and yes. it was 50% uh, pups, does that mean that 50% of the adult of the females had pups? Right. Or so that the pups were, you were counting the pups separately? This was just to represent a ratio. So for example, um, when the data was being collected and you're, you're counting the number of otters in that group, in this scan data, they were not necessarily sexing those individuals, okay? So we were just counting adults, and then there was how many pups in with those adults. Okay. So what this would mean was that if I say that there's a group size of 10, 10 adults, five of them have pups. Yeah, so it's 50% of that ratio. So if there's one otter, does that mean there's a 50% chance that that otter has a pup? Yeah, so it's so interesting. Probability is rough when you're considering just one individual, but yes. <laughs> Sometimes it's easier to just, if you are thinking about one, just pretend that there's 10 and then do it that way. But yes, it would mean that half a pup was there <laughs> with that individual. Yeah. yeah there, when you consider the Morro Bay issue, which is a recommendation going forward, yeah. are there any hypotheses you would give them about exactly, you mentioned about reproductive females. What about the availability of better food, say a lot of crabs or something like that, or the fact that Blase but there's a lot of busyness there, so they're very ur urbanized uh, otters, for example, versus Monterey. Any hypothesis come to mind as you're moving forward? Right, so specifically for Morro Bay, what was interesting is, so this project, when, we, when it was first developed, was really just focused on activity with disturbance and then, for my project, energetics of that activity. Habituation was sort of brought up after that popped up in analysis. So once we saw that, that was sort of like, whoa, something is happening here. And so it is true that there was one idea that there could be the fact that there is a higher ratio for mom and pup pairs in Morro Bay. It is a very reproductive area. It's like a nursery down there. So when you go out there, majority of those females have pups with them. Um, so that was one of the hypotheses is that perhaps they are resisting becoming active because having a pup is probably exhausting. Um, <laughs> I can assume it's exhausting. Um, the other one would be the fact that, yeah, perhaps there is habituation, which is a very complex term to use. So in a lot of the literature, you have to be very specific on your definitions when you're researching habituation, because if you're using sensitivity, right, which is kind of what we were doing, right, increase in activity, um, if we were to look at that, we would have to include alert, because right now we're just changing of, of that, but I do think that alert would be another behavior to, to include in that. But what's interesting is for Morro Bay, it, has similar, it's very similar to Moss Landing, okay? These are two groups that are in a harbor habitat and they have boat launches. And so what's interesting is why is Morro Bay, if it is habituation, if that's what we're trying, they're just not as sensitive to the fact, they're used to the fact that all those people are coming by, 
how is moss landing different? Um, there is thoughts that with moss landing, um, it is a male group, so they are not necessarily going to, if there's a pup issue there, maybe they're not resisting that change. Another thing is that as they have young males coming through, maybe they are not habituating, this, habituating the same way, right? Because they constantly have new influx of individuals coming through. Um, another thing for Morrow Bay, and it has not been published yet, you need to publish that, <laughs> um, is that Morrow Bay is interesting also because that group where we were looking at Target Rock, so if you were familiar with Morrow Bay, the big rock, there's an inlet there, and there's a group of otters um, that likes to rest there in that kelp when kelp is, is there, and that is a group that sort of appeared more recently, all right? So more and more otters are coming into this bay and it's happening quite quickly. And so that could also be sort of an impact and habituation. If they, they are actually sort of recruiting this area for the first time in a long time, that's a whole other question that would be really interesting to focus on. And I know that there's other areas that can maybe, um, Avila Beach, I think, was another one that's being included. So Seattle Savvy is actually including new areas along the coastline to start looking at areas with less disturbance, more disturbance, areas that are being recruited as sea otters are coming in. Um, so it's a fascinating question, I do. I think this is, this is just a foundation. There's so many more questions to move forward with. Can I just say one thing? Yeah. So we did try to choose a few locations that we thought would have low rates of disturbance and what we discovered was that even those places <laughs> Yeah. or had, had kayak traffic um, more than we expected. Yeah. And so in order to account for that, we're really going to have to go like to Big Sur. Big Sur, yeah. Areas where you're not having at all. So that, that you need a control. And the only problem, though, is even considering that you would have to do Big Sur, watching otters that far offshore and trying to get distances is so difficult. Yeah, so there would be cool. having to think about how, and then you're also at a higher level. So it would be an interesting way to, to figure out what is the the best, but yeah. yeah. I know you said uh, like uh, some some are different specialists, but do you think uh, food availability at these different locations might kind of have like it's all sand and they're going after worms, or if you have like any any data like Pisco data or anything like that that kind of overlays with that that we can say oh, maybe this is why. Like yeah. maybe more Bay has got just a ton more food, so it's a better nursery. Maybe. So really good question. Um, the answer is that the, da the data is definitely there. Sea Otter, the Sea Otter Research Program is fantastic. They're fully covered. There's a lot of collaboration. Um, it, I have not looked at that specifically. I am not familiar with what specifically the forages or if there's specific specialization just in Morro Bay, but it's an interesting question, and I'm sure it's possible to start looking at. There's a new student, I think starting in fall, that's going to be looking at foraging specifically in Morro Bay, and so that is something to consider as well, because obviously what's there is going to affect what they do, right? They have to eat. If they are burning through that many calories, they are very food motivated. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Heather, is there any new technology that would going forward that change your research? This is hypothetical. Yeah. Silent drones, for example, allow you to observe these things differently than you do now, or other things, satellite analysis that would give you better. And if you had those, would it make much difference relative to the conclusion you come to? So that's a good question. You know, tech, I actually feel like a lot of times technology is already there. It's just a matter of do we have enough money to, to get that technology for a lot of this. Um, drones is, is an interesting one because though drones can be used um, to be able to photograph and get sort of aerial views and that can be super useful in limiting how you interact with a species. However, you do have to be very careful. Drones have also been known to cause a lot of disturbance. Um, so there is sort of a fine line of understanding, well, again, maybe they would have to be figuring out what that distance is in the really high quality camera to be far enough away. Um, if that w was affordable and you could use that, I do think that that would be interesting to use in ways that if you are in Big Sur, for example, and you cannot necessarily get that close, that would be really interesting. Um, there also, I do, I don't think Joe's here. Joe was talking about earlier that they have a new development tag that's sort of using, um, it allows them to, it's satellite tags, but allows to speak to each other. So it's a way for us to collect data where the sea otters are almost collecting it for us. And then that pings back to a station. So there's definitely technology there. It's more an issue of, can we get the funding to be able to, to use it? Measuring heart rate. Heart rate, yes. And I think oh. Pete has been talking to Tim about heart rate. <laughs> that would be fascinating. Especially with alert, right? If you could record heart rate at the same time as being able to look at behavior, 
with it being alert, that'd be really, really cool. Colleen. Uh, sorry if I missed this, but how did you deal with kayak when there are multiple kayaks traveling together? Very, very good. So um, when you were collecting the data in those scans, the answer is that there's always moments of complete chaos. So sometimes you're doing this and it's so easy. There's one kayak that comes by, you're recording. And actually, I think I have a little schematic to give you kind of a visual of what this would look like. <laughs> but um, this is the easy one. Let's say it's easy. You just sit in there, one kayak comes by, it's perfect. It passes, you're able to get all the distances. There are times where you're gonna have multiple kayaks coming and some of them are not gonna be easily lined up. So you do have to account for the degrees as well as, and you can use a triangulation app to actually find that exact distance. Um, if kayaks were really tightly clumped together, you can basically go from the center of that, but including the number of those kayaks. So I, I don't know if you were here for this, but I'll show this again. So the perturbation variables was sort of, it was essentially how we, you needed all three of these to, oh, I guess I have to start from, Right, so you have to know what type of stimulus it is. We also had to record how many of each one of those are and then that distance. So all of that's information that's being recorded. The truth is you can't do this as one person. That's why <laughs> it's really great that for the volunteers, you go in pairs, sometimes there's three at a time. Yeah, maybe Joan, Joan's the master of this. She is very good. It does take practice. It does take a lot of, um, it does take a lot of time. The volunteers that do this are really highly trained, okay? So it's citizen science, but they're excellent at what they do. I, I, one of the um, um, what devices or the better device that uh, is needed in the field is uh, better distance measurements. The standard um, the rangefinders, range yeah, they can ping are, off of certain things. Yeah, they don't like to ping off of ours because they're not reflecting. Yeah. <laughs> even if it's a large, even if it's a, I mean, I can have a yeah. dozen otters out there and it's tough. So I mean, I know where the I, you know. I, I use other things. To right, do that. and I think that's part of it too, right? Once you really get to get familiar with your location and your spots, right. and you have specific things. That but you that would be fantastic if somebody could come up. We need better range finders. Yeah, <laughs> maybe we need more money, more expensive range finders. Maybe they make them better. So I know you said you view this model as kind of a tool to help inform management, but in your, I guess, opinion and experience, spending a lot of time watching otters, what do you think is the way forward, how do we kind of mitigate some of this and what are the policies that you think personally would be good to implement? That's an excellent question. Um, so I will first off give a plug that there is a disturbance um, symposium that's put on each year and it allows people from management agencies, biologists, as well as public, basically all these different sort of stakeholders in understanding what's happening, coming together and creating a discussion. Okay, so I don't think that there's ever going to be one thing because I don't think that making a law is necessarily going to solve the problem. People don't like reading, being told what to do. I mean, there's obviously, it's 50 yards right now and no one adheres to that and it's posted, but it's not necessarily, even if they say it's posted on a sign, no one reads signs. So I do think that an estimated distance or range of distances is recommended because there are some people, you have all different types of people. Some people are listeners, some people are visual learners. Everyone takes information differently. And so I think we have to provide something that kind of gives all of that perhaps a distance, an estimate of what that would mean for them in kayak lengths, perhaps a behavior that you'd be looking for. I don't think it's one. I think you have to put outreach out there and put the information in all the different forms and get, get that across, yeah. yeah. Don't discount signs. Yeah, well, and that's the thing. Some people do read signs, yeah. Some yeah. people do, and you can always point to it if you're out in the field yeah. trying to educate the public as opposed to you just talking it and then you get the, well, who are you? Yeah. <laughs> are you the police? Yeah. Well, look, there's actually, yeah, there's so it depends. <laughs> uh, going off of that, what do you say to people who um, have a sea otter come up to them and they say, oh, the sea otter, you know, came up to me, I, like, what can I do about that? That is a very common question. So that, that's a, um, what I would say is that, first of all, with looking at the science behind this, we really were more concerned with resting becoming active. For active otters, foraging in the slough, and we do know certain people that do work in kayak shops, and, and they have been very helpful in, in understanding this, is that as you're kayaking through, if you're seeing foragers pop up, and they're active, and they might see you, and they might dive down, that you just keep going. You know, it's your responsibility to not necessarily keep harassing them, but they're already active. That's less of a concern as opposed to going through a resting group of otters that are obviously resting for a very important reason because they're burning through all that fuel. 
Um, for otters that are curious, that happens. However, I would say that generally, and this is true for many mammals, is that they are curious, however, it's a behavior that's learned. They might try something once, and if it was never sort of like, oh, that was a bad idea, they'll keep doing it. So generally, if there's an otter that comes up to a kayak and wants to climb up on that kayak, first of all, sea otters climbing up in kayaks is like watching a clown show. They are horrible at climbing up on anything because they have soggy bottoms. So like they're really bottom heavy. So trying to climb up on a kayak, they're going to do multiple tries of getting up there before they get there. So I would say that you're watching them do that. And that's your responsibility is to make sure that you can just use your paddle and say, nope, and you just keep moving. So that would be my answer is that it's your responsibility to keep them wild. Yeah. So I know that our teams were collecting um, a couple of uh, data points on abiotic factors. Yeah. How did those, how were those incorporated into your analysis? Yes, so um, what she's referring to is that we, there was definitely tide as well as wind that was recorded during all of these scans. And before I came into using this model, it was incorporated as some of the um, variables that we went through, right? But they did not have any statistical effect. So they were removed mainly because even though this is a model that can use a lot of different variables, there is still a risk that you can over-parameterize. And so that they were just removed. But it is a good question, and we were actually talking about maybe even looking at adding them back, seeing what would happen if we added them back in. But yeah. I'm going to go ahead and say thank you to Heather. <laughs>